cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. All right. On the podcast today, I have someone I have been wanting to interview for, for well, ever since I saw him do a presentation, my initial reaction was, get this guy on the podcast. I was fortunate to meet Will, Will Hughes, who's on at... Uh, an EO event, this entrepreneurship group that I'm in, where he did a presentation and right afterwards, it knocked my socks off. I was like, I got to work with this guy. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that. But uh, he's been traveling the world and finally has made time for me. But Will, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back in San Diego and uh, great to see you again. That's right. You're in San Diego. You're in lots of different hemispheres and time zones, but now you, you've settled down. So um, we're just going to jump into it. We can do some banter and all the small talk. Um, we'll save that for the end. But um, this is something I've been talking on the podcast, but like, what is liquid mind? Everybody wants to know what is it? Sure. So yeah, I teach a masterclass on business creativity and innovation. So I've created frameworks for how to think differently, how to think creatively. And what I'm after is how can we get insights that everybody else misses? So I teach these techniques to have big creative breakthrough ideas on a regular basis, right? What I'm after is I'm trying to get people to at least once or twice a month. And this matters because creativity equals innovation and innovation equals revenue. So um, I built this masterclass and it's probably helpful if I give you just a little background on how it came about. So, um, yeah. okay, so I'll jump into that. So I was the head of growth marketing. I've been a vice president of growth marketing at a bunch of different companies. Um, I started um, at a fashion agency, a women's fashion agency. We had 50 different uh, clients that ranged from 20 million all the way up to a billion. And then uh, I was the head of growth marketing at several brands, including Organifi. And a lot of people know the D2C brand Organifi, uh, the green juice company, right? And when I got there, the CEO had given me a goal um, to grow the company from 18 million to 100 million in revenue in 18 months. And when I first got that goal, I was a bit frustrated. I mean, that's a really aggressive goal. And I was told I needed to do it at a break even or a profit, which makes it even harder, right? And, you know, I was frustrated for a day or two, like, God, that's really aggressive. It's not really how this works. And it kind of felt like I was getting set up for failure a little bit. But um, I sat back with it and I actually started to get energized by this goal because the way I could think to actually achieve it was I was going to have to think differently than everybody else when it comes to digital marketing, when it comes to growth. And if I could think differently, I could create frameworks. And if I could create frameworks, I could make them repeatable. And this is just for me, right? I'm just doing this for myself. And that's exactly what I did. I started to test these creative ways of approaching digital marketing using frameworks, a kind of step-by-step -step process to give me um, different insights, to help me be creative, to help me innovate, right? Instead of copying what everybody else is doing, I wanted to innovate something new. And I just had a lot of success in using these techniques. I mean, it starts and stops and um, it was probably over the course of about a year that I was playing with these techniques and I, you know, initially was having a fair amount of success using them, but they came with a lot of friction, like a lot of effort to implement these techniques and use them. And um, so over time, I started slowly stripping out the friction points so that it's a very light effort and a really hard, hard, high ROI, right? And um, from there, it kind of just took off for me. And then I just started uh, teaching it to some of my friends. Um, I did hit the goal, by the way. I got Organified at 100 million run rate in about 18 months. It was, I think it was 19 months, but you know, give or take. Um, and so I went to a mastermind uh, that I was running and uh, brought it up to a couple of friends. And they're like, wow, that's really interesting. Can you teach us? And so I put together like a 20 minute talk on it. And they all said, wait, 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 this is really cool. Go back and give us more. And so I built it into an hour. 
And then, you know, I built it into two hours and, you know, over time it evolved into now that it's, it's a six hour, a six week training uh, with six different techniques. And um, it's just been, it's been really fun because it's replicable, right? The success I've had, I've gotten two companies now to a hundred million in uh, revenue in really short time frames, And the people I've been teaching have been having the same success. They're achieving these seemingly impossible goals by using the frameworks. And um, you know, feel free to ask any questions additionally, but I also brought for you a training today. So I'm gonna actually just give you some insight into the kind of things that I teach, which um, I think would add value to both you and your listeners. So we can, we can jump into that too. No, I mean, I, I think that's so like intriguing. I'm sure everybody listening, because I was after the talk and I got to see the examples of literally how you grew Organify from under 20 million to 100 million in that insane time frame. And I think what also was really impressive is you're like, wow, this framework works really well on a business. What if I point it on myself? And you've been able to kind of with escape velocity go out of working in the corporate job to being this kind of solo entrepreneur that's doing phenomenally well. I don't know how much you want to speak to that, but I think that's really exciting because not only have you applied it to your business, but to like how you want to design your life, which I think people can easily overlook because they're just chasing dollars and things, but using this in, in different facets. And just to be very transparent, um, my, myself, my partner, Jonathan, we've hired Will um, to go through the mastermind and we're almost done with it. And it's it's been very energizing to say the least, as far as kind of starting to look at things from a different lens. And so I know I'm excited to get into the the workshop, but any, any other color just on like breaking out and putting this on yourself. Cause I think what's also cool is you've gone from working at a corporate job to like you're your own CEO running this company that that's doing very well. Yeah, for sure. So I, I kind of joke, it's the Shawshank story. I feel like I was institutionalized, right? Like I, I was always corporate. I was a corporate guy and um, had a lot of success in building companies and making other people wealthy. And, um, you know, I wanted to be able to leverage that for myself. And so I did get two companies to 100 million. And I just recently heard a third company I consulted with, they're actually going to hit 100 million this year. Um, uh, but then to your point, I have also started, like, you can you can use these techniques that we'll kind of get into here. Um, both for personal and business. And I've been, been able to achieve some really great personal goals as well. So, you know, my income, you know, I did step out of the corporate world and started focusing on myself. And, you know, my income, you know, went exponentially higher, over seven figures. Um, I hit some other goals that were really big in my life. I wanted to travel overseas. I hadn't been overseas in almost 15 years. And for the last two years, I've taken uh, four trips a year overseas. Um, most of it for business and most of it paid for by other people that I turn it into a vacation, right? Um, I just achieved another goal um, you kind of alluded to, which is I wanted to live and work overseas. So I spent the last six weeks in Brazil uh, working remotely, which was spectacular. We were up in the northern part of Brazil in um, this really cool like Caribbean style town. And then uh, spent a couple of weeks in Rio, which uh, Rio is one of my favorite cities in the world. So, yeah, this stuff works for both personal and professional. And it's a total repeatable process. It's just it's simply like, like here's what people need to know. And this will come up in the, in the, in the little teaching I'm going to do here. But we all think in thought patterns. And the problem is our thought patterns are really helpful to us. It's a way to think efficiently. It's a way for the brain to shortcut getting to a solution as quickly as you can. And so when you face a new problem or challenge, if it's in any way similar to a problem or challenge you've had previously, your brain's going to go back to the way you solved it last time. It's a very efficient way to do it. And that's great. But it also is very blinding to any other approach, right? Your brain's leaning on the crutch of what's worked in previously, and you won't be thinking about other perspectives or opportunities. And so we're blinded by this thought pattern. It's really great for efficient thinking, but it's the antithesis of creative thinking. So I want to help people break free of your thought pattern and be able to think from a second perspective. 
And that's that's exactly what I've, I've got kind of queued up for if you want to jump into that. Yeah, let, let's do it. Because I think everyone's like, okay, I want those results. Sign me up. But like, what's he talking about with Liquid Mind? And what is like this, this framework and approach? And so, and again, parts of it is like, the mastermind, but um, really generous to kind of go through some some stuff today. So yeah, well, we'll let's get into it, man. Enlighten yeah, me for sure. And it's a <laughs> just just to be clear, it's a master class, not a mastermind. But yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So all right. So this um, this is just a mini training. It's probably I don't know, like ten minutes, but it's it's really cool, and it's just a way um, to show people how to change your perspective, how to see things differently. And how to find a new, uh, find new opportunities, right? And this is the techniques that I've used. This is part of the techniques that I use to think differently and how I scaled up multiple businesses to 100 million. Um, I like to profile people that are either well-known business leaders, sometimes even unknown business leaders, but people in my network, or um, people who've done something really impressive. In this case, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I'll show you what kind of you know, amazing result they had or what they did differently and how we then pull that down into a framework and apply it to our business. So I, I, I just covered this, so I don't, I don't have to go to, um, you know, there are slides that we're going to look at here for anyone that's watching, um, but otherwise um, we'll just describe what we're seeing uh, for those listening. But I just kind of covered that we all have this hidden limitation and we're blinded by this limitation. We just don't realize it. And more importantly, we don't realize how much it's clouding our vision. And the limitation is the thought pattern. And I just described it, so I won't go through the whole exercise again. But what it does is thought patterns help us to think efficiently, but they hurt us from thinking in a creative way. So we're always approaching solving problems from the same way. And sort of a good visual representation of this is on the screen now. And for those listening, it's... Um, it's just a heat map of people who are looking at news websites. So like the New York Times or Washington Post or blogs or whatever. And it's a heat map of their eye tracking, right? So where do the eyes go when you get to the New York Times? And what is very obvious is everyone is going straight for the content. And the content is, all, as we all know, it's always on the left side of the page. And what's at the top and on the right of the page? It's always the banner ads. And over time, we've learned that there's useless information in those slots. And so we don't even see the ads, right? It's banner blindness. And so the heat map is just illustrating that we've figured out that the content's on the left and we're gonna go straight to the left. Um, but if you take that as a correlation to business, um, what if there was something really amazing in the top of this page or on the right of the page, right? What if the big idea was there? You're gonna miss it because you're always approaching it from the same way for efficiency's sake. And that's the problem. So we wanna learn how to break free of these thought patterns. We have this established way of approaching problems and we're gonna use that established way time and time and time again. And the problem with that is it doesn't allow us to consider alternatives and it doesn't allow us to find creative solutions, right? That's the problem. So it gives us this tunnel vision. It locks us into seeing from one single perspective. Um, and we want to break free of that. So what Neil deGrasse Tyson says, um, the view of Earth from Earth is very different from the view of Earth from space, right? So if you're walking on Earth through the woods, taking a hike, obviously you're walking on the grass. You can see the river. You, you're, you can see the trees in front of you and above you. And obviously, if you're viewing it from space, you're seeing Earth as the, the large, you know, round sphere and the blue oceans and maybe the city lights or whatever. You're looking at the same thing. You're just looking at it from a massively different perspective. And when you can look at things from different perspective, it's an unlock right? It opens your mind. It breaks you free of the thought pattern and it breaks you free of thinking the same way. It helps you try to notice new things, new opportunities that everybody else is missing. So that's, that's what we're shooting for here. And so what I want to give you in this little training is I want to help change your perspective so that you can see opportunities that you wouldn't see otherwise. And the quote I like to use here is, I want you to see what you don't and your competitors can't. So it's just a little unlock technique that we're gonna cover right here. Uh, it breaks you out of that thought pattern and the single perspective that's limiting your vision. 
So a study that Neil deGrasse Tyson brought up in a, a recent interview, um, I think is a good one uh, to use here, which is Gallup does a poll, a survey, um, year over year over year on crime statistics and safety. And every single, not crime statistics, sorry about that, crime and safety. And um, year over year, people are reporting that for the last 30 years, we feel less safe than we did the previous year. So year over year, we feel less safe. But then he referenced a second study, which shows that violent crime is actually falling year over year over year. So we feel less safe, but violent crime is falling. And the reason for that is our perspective. Right, we're seeing more crime on television. There's more cameras. Everyone's got an iPhone, you know, a camera in their phone. Of course, there's more TV shows about cops and crime and crime stories. So we see more of it than any ever before, and it's more violent. Right, we have the school shootings and things that really terrify us. So it really is upsetting, and it shifts our perspective. So we think we're getting less safe when in reality we're getting more safe. So what's happening here is our perspective, it's actually wrong. And that's the first part of the unlock right there. So if you translate that to business, a, a, a question I'll ask myself that's really useful, Jim, is um, what if your perspective is wrong? And so what I mean by that is, let's say you're dealing with a problem in your business or a goal you're trying to achieve. You're going to go about coming up with a solution the way you always do and using your typical thought pattern. And that's great. But now let's, to get to the unlock, to get to a second perspective, if you ask yourself the question, what if my perspective is wrong, it can help you find an alternative solution. And it'll push you beyond to look for something new, which may just be more creative. Now, the only caveat I'll give to this is asking yourself this question. It's not intended to um, make you second guess your first solution. I'm not trying to bring in self-doubt or limiting beliefs um, or the second guessing game. It should actually be an exciting activity. You're just simply asking yourself, is there a better solution? Is there a more elegant solution to what I'm doing here? And this is the way to unlock that is, well, what if my perspective is wrong? What if there's a different way to approach it? Because once you ask that question, you'll come up with a different solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, it kind of makes me think as like the, the prompt is, what if my perspective is actually wrong? And then I'm like, okay, if it's true or if it's wrong and this is true, then this other thing has to be right. And that's when you start to go down the path of looking at it from a different perspective, yeah. because I think it's really easy just to apply your common framework to everything you see. But when you pause and think and reset, yep. it gets you starting to open your mind a little bit more. That's exactly it. It's an unlock to the thought pattern we're locked in. It's an opener. That's it's exactly right. So this is a way to get to a second perspective. So let's just do a little case example of a business that was failing, but then the CEO had a shift in perspective and they became one of the fastest growing companies of all time. So the company is TinySpec. So they were founded back in 2010. Um, they were a multiplayer online role-playing game and it was called Glitch. And the company had raised uh, $15 million across two rounds of funding. But when they launched the game Glitch, it actually didn't, it didn't go too well. Um, people found the game confusing. They didn't have the, uh, you know, the, the gamers coming back again and again. They try it once or twice and they bail out. It wasn't getting virality, right? It just, it didn't, it didn't do well. And so the company was failing and was close to shuttering the, you know, shuttering the business. But the CEO actually was able to change his perspective, which as a founder is very difficult to totally see another opportunity because your identity is wrapped up in the business. We're a gaming company and I've raised $15 million telling this story. So it's actually really impressive what was done here. But the CEO found a new opportunity and the opportunity came from a completely unexpected direction. And what had happened was they had built this product productivity tool in-house for themselves to work with their overseas staff, just a way for communication to flow. And it was so valuable. Um, that's where they were like seeing this addictive nature, not on the video game. Any guesses to who the company is? Do you know, do you know who Tiny Spec uh, evolved into? It, it turned into Slack, didn't it? Yeah, there you go, that's Slack. Awesome. Yeah. Right? 
So they, they figured out how valuable uh, this tool was. They rebranded as Slack. And what's also interesting is they started to share Slack with some of their friends at other companies. And they quickly were getting the same traction they got internally. People were using it. It's sort of addictive. It's a more efficient tool. Um, and so it was clear this actually had real commercial potential. But it took this shift in perspective and really a shattering of the ego of the CEO, Stuart Butterfield, to make this shift. Right. If he let his ego control it, he would have gone you know, down with the ship on the gaming company. So what, is, what does this translate into? Slack is the uh, company that reached a billion dollar valuation. I, th I think it's a, the fastest or second fastest ever. They got to a billion valuation in eight months. Wow. Uh, ChatGPT probably just did it faster, I would guess. But, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they spent zero dollars on traditional advertising and they didn't even have a CMO. This was all done through word of mouth that got them uh, that got this product taking off. So they were doing things differently all the way around the board. Slack currently is valued at 23 billion and it's used by 77% of the Fortune 500. So what we want people to learn here is having a, the ability to view things with a second perspective or another perspective gives you the chance to see things differently and unlock opportunities and innovations that you would normally miss. Right. If you just follow your thought pattern and come to the first conclusion, you're going to miss the potential creative thought, the innovative thought. So let me give you one more example. Um, so Airbnb uh, launched this campaign in 2016 called Live There. And this was a shift on their perspective of their marketing. Up to this point, what they've been marketing was Airbnb is a cheaper you know, solution for accommodations. Right. We're cheaper than hotels. Um, and they did a total shift into this campaign called Live There. And what they were encouraging was for travelers to experience their vacations and destinations as if they were a local, right? Don't go to Paris as a tourist, have an experience like a local would. And that's some of the feedback they were picking up on is that travelers wanted this authentic local experience. So they shifted their marketing from, you know, we're cheaper to we're giving people these authentic experiences. And the competition all stayed on the other side of the fence. They were selling on price and selling that we have better you know, accommodations and tours than everybody else. So um, in this positioning of selling authentic local experiences, the result is from 2015 to 2016, Airbnb's revenue went from 1.7 billion to 2.6 billion, 900 million in growth. Now you can't put it all on this campaign, but it was a highly successful campaign that really resonated with users. And it took that shift in perspective to get there. So any change in your perspective can reveal new information. Um, you know, we need to constantly be looking at things from a different way. And so when you can get into a framework, a step-by-step, -step, it'll really help you apply it to a business in a consistent way so you can unlock new ideas. So last kind of thing to teach here is like, how to have a second perspective or an example of how I might think about it is if you are trying to solve a problem in your business or how you go about achieving a goal in your business, you know, first ask yourself how you're going to get there from your first person perspective, the way you would always go about thinking about a solution. Once you get that solution, then try to view it from another perspective. And the way it might be helpful to think about it is what would someone else in the business or close to the business, think about that same question? Like what would your mentor or investor think about that same question? Because they have a different view. Or what would a sales executive think about that question? Because they're gonna have a different view. And so the example I'd give there is, uh, maybe I'm doing some growth planning and I'm the CEO of this company. And uh, my perspective is in the last 12 months, some things have gone well, while other things have not gone so well. And so we're gonna see just a, a modest growth this year, maybe 3%. And that's my perspective. But then can you now think, you know, get other perspectives here, right? So you might go to the sales executive and the sales executive might say, well, we lost the last seven deals in a row because our competitor is cleaning our clock and they've got something better. And so my perspective is we're actually going to shrink. We're going to, we're going to fall backwards 20% this year. But then you go to the investor and the investor is going to say, well, I've got a view of, you know, 20 companies, 40 companies, 50 companies. And if you just make this one tweak in your positioning, 
you're going to outperform those competitors and I'm going to make an investment and you're, you can then leverage marketing platforms you're not. And I see a 30% growth for your company, right? So just trying to illustrate how can you unlock using a second perspective? How can you see what you don't and your competitors can't? So all that makes sense, Jim? No, it totally does. I think one like prompt too that I like for seeing a different perspective is putting on these different hats. It's like, okay, yep. I'm I'm Jim right now. What's my perspective? Okay, let me put it on as my growth lead. Let me put it on as customer service. Let me put it on as like, you know, my friend that I'm trying to talk to and impress or, you know, someone that's in a totally different industry. Like I have a a buddy of mine who's the CMO of a public traded company where his background is as a developer. And I always love his perspective because it's it's usually much more original and different than someone with a traditional marketing perspective. And then yeah. even my buddy, like Tommy, that like is all about work-life design and like how they structure things. And I think it's it's easy to put those guardrails on your perspective. You're like, oh yeah, I'm looking at it from all different views. But when you really be like, oh, what would... Tommy say or Rob say, um, that can really be a, be a big unlock. That's right. And so Tommy and Rob being, in this case, sort of mentors, I mean, colleagues, but mentors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's always useful for me to think about it. Like, what would a, you know, if you had a chairman, what would the chairman think? Or what would the investor think? Who's got a broader view of things? And then someone in the weeds, like the sales executive. So yeah, perfect. Um, so what Neil deGrasse Tyson says is we need exposure to other ways of thinking. And like I, that is something that's missing in the digital marketing world, right? Exposure to other ways of thinking, more creative thinking, more innovation. And the, what he talks about in his latest book, it's called The Cosmic, Cosmic Perspective. And what he says is we all feel like we're the center of the universe at times. And certainly founders and CEOs always think we're the center of the universe, right? The world revolves around us and our opinion is always right. Right. So this perspective we have and our thought pattern is limiting our view. It's giving us a very narrow view of how things work and blocking us from the opportunities that might be right in front of us. We just can't see that. So what Neil is talking about is if you can get a size adjustment on the vastness of the universe, it can shatter that ego and open the mind to just considering another perspective. And so what he talks about is you know, there's a billion stars in the universe. There's billions of galaxies in the universe, like our Milky Way. And don't forget, you're standing on a rock moving through space at 67,000 miles an hour. And what he's trying to do there is he's trying to put you in your place, right? He's trying to shift your perspective. So if you can put your life into the perspective of the vastness of the universe, it'll make you feel less significant. It shatters that ego that I'm the master of the universe and the world revolves around me. And I'm most importantly, that I'm always right. Because once you say that, there might be an alternative solution that might actually be better. And it's just a creativity exercise, right? That's all I'm after here. It's just a creativity exercise to get you a second perspective. It open, you said this yourself, it opens the mind to other views and other vantage points. So that's what we want to do here. So what I'm teaching in this little mini session is we want to change, we want you to have the ability to change your perspective. And the reason you want to be able to change your perspective is to unlock something creative, something new, and have, you know, get to a place of innovation. What I rail against, and you know this, is copy culture. I can't stand that if someone's going to go out and build the new, you know, subscription program, 99 out of 100 times, they're going to go look at a brand that they admire, and they're going to copy their subscription program, right? Like, for the love of God, innovate become an innovator. And that's what I'm trying to teach. So uh, just, I, I, if you get me started on copy culture, I'll never stop. So I guess I'll move on. So let me just give a quick summary. We can wrap this up, right? So um, we're all limited by these thought patterns that we have. That's really good and helpful for efficient thinking, but it's just limiting when it comes to creative thinking. It limits us by having one single perspective. And what's hopefully new here is that that perspective might actually be wrong, right? In the Gallup poll thing from Neil deGrasse Tyson, people's view is actually wrong. So just asking that question to yourself, it's just an unlock. It's just a little trick to push through um, and see if you can ask things from another perspective. And if you can do that, that's a competitive advantage.
right? It can give you a broader vision for creativity and innovation. And that's what I want to create. I want people to be creative and innovative. So I'll throw a challenge out to people. Just a seven-day challenge, right? Take any problem in your business or any goal you're trying to achieve and then outline your first approach to, to that solution, right? What's the first solution that you would come up with and outline that? Um, then what we want you to do is provide a second perspective that's completely different from the first. Try that on and check out the results from that. So you want to come up with the first answer, the logical answer, the obvious answer that you would always come up with and then come up with the non-obvious answer, right? Let that sink in for a minute. What's the non-obvious answer? And the way Margaret Atwood says, uh, presents this is she's um, a writer. She wrote The Handmaid's Tale. She says she likes to present an uncommon point of view. And again, that one really resonates with me, like the non-obvious answer, the uncommon point of view. So let's just, last point here is, what are some uncommon points of view in business? How about when Airbnb first launched? right? Renting your couch to strangers was an insane idea when it was first rolling out. And in fact, the early investors they went to, they asked them, literally asked them in the room, we hope this is not the only business plan you're working on. We hope you have something better, right? And those investors passed on Airbnb. Um, how about Impossible Foods, right? Plant-based plant -based burgers that taste like real meat. Um, you know, getting plants to taste like meat not really a common point of view. Um, and currently, I think they're at 1.4 billion, I think was their revenue last year. So they're clearly killing it. And how about Netflix shifting from DVDs, which was doing great, to streaming well ahead of customer adoption, right? So being in the forefront of these. So these would be an uncommon points of view at the time. And so looking for the non-obvious answer or the uncommon point of view is the reframing. Right? It's just an exercise of reframing the mind. And those little tips kind of help me do the reframe. So Jim, I'll offer this um, to any listeners. Um, I have a training. It's actually the one you saw when I presented at EO. And it's about a 30 to 35 minute training that I gave at Oxford University last summer. So I call it the Oxford framework just because I, I, I created it for that presentation. And it actually goes into more detail on how people can change their perspective. And I'll offer it for free on, on my website and just go there and um, unlock it. Um, what I teach in that is, um, I know there's a concept you like because we've talked about it a few times. I teach like, what are we all overvaluing and undervaluing in our business that is blocking us from seeing something new or creative or innovative? And then how can we think from different angles, altitudes, and directions? These are all ways to change your perspective. So I do have this training. Again, it's, it's, it's a detailed 30, 35 minute training. Um, and if you just go to the website, it's liquidmindmasterclass.com and then put in forward slash Oxford for Oxford University, forward slash Oxford. And um, you can just fill out the little form on the page, just you know, name, email, and unlock it. And uh, you can go to that uh, free training. So uh, you can put the link in the show notes, but liquidmindmasterclass.com forward slash uh, Oxford and um, check out that training. It's, it's, um, it's how Jim and I met. Yeah, the, yeah, the Oxford framework is really exciting because it, it kind of takes that idea of a different perspective and it really gives some cool frameworks on it. And you had a really cool example on direct-to-consumer companies, what they're overvaluing versus undervaluing that I think a lot of people um, listening to this would be interested in. So my, my, I think a lot of people listen, they're like, okay, think from a different perspective. At a 30,000 foot level, it makes a lot of sense. As you get into like practice of it, I think you started to hit some walls or roadblocks. And so I don't know if it'd be helpful. Um, well, we could even like think through it for like one of my companies, which might be interesting. Or two, if, if there's any examples you could give, I don't know how much you can talk to the Organifi example. I know we talked about it offline, but as far as, you know, what did you do to look at things from a second perspective that had this huge unlock or, or any other like examples that people could kind of latch on to? Um, okay, so sure. Um, so, th th so th this is actually a framework for me. So I apply this as one of the steps that I'm going to use every time I'm thinking about a problem in my business or a goal I'm trying to achieve. 
So the goal might be, how do we double revenue by the end of the year? And a problem might be, um, hey, we don't have, our lifetime value is not, not where it needs to be. We need a, a better, longer lifetime value. And maybe, um, you know, to get specific, maybe what you want to do is build a better subscription program. And so what I do is I take the frameworks that I teach, and again, you can get that framework for free uh, on the website. And what I do is I apply it to the leverage points of the business. And so what are the leverage points of the business? Those are the opportunities where you can pick up, you know, strong growth or efficiency, right? You cut costs or, or, or growth. And so in, I mostly work with DTC brands. So leverage points are going to be things like subscription programs and copywriting and bundling and funnels and, you know, videos and creative and all these things, right? So each one of those would be a leverage point in the business. And so what I want to do is take the framework, the step-by-step -step framework of which changing perspective is one example of the framework, but take these frameworks and apply it to the leverage point in the business. And the reason I'm doing this is rather than just saying, I want to build a subscription program, I'm going to copy what everybody else did. Um, I want you to innovate. I want people to be creators and innovators because that actually can unlock it can have such higher return than just copying what everybody else is doing, right? There's, there's multiple problems with copying what everyone else is doing. Number one, even if a brand is someone you admire, it doesn't mean they've got the most efficient funnel or offers or bundles or su subscription programs. And if everyone's just copying everybody else, it becomes a race to the bottom actually, right? And on top of it, even if it's something good, it leads to oversaturation in the market of whatever it is we're copying, copy, you know, copy offers, video formats, funnels, it dilutes the impact on the customer if everyone's just copying everybody else. So it makes everyone collectively less effective, right? So copying is what I'm railing against. And what I want people to do is to be original. I want them to be an innovator. I want them to, to become an innovator. So by taking the framework and applying it to the leverage points of your business, you can look at a subscription program and Mike, the question I would ask there is how can you design a subscription program that's going to have a 20% you know, higher lifetime value than my nearest competitor? And once you start thinking like that, it'll unlock um, new opportunities rather than I'm just going to rip everybody else off. And so sometimes the shifts for me are like just two degree shifts, something small, but high impact right there. It's not a very, it's not like I just, like there's some massive innovation, but it's a shift in the way I'm positioning things. Um, and it might just be this two degree shift, but high impact. And sometimes I actually am coming up with something completely new. And, um, you know, staying with the subscription program one, you know, I did have a breakthrough on that one uh, recently, which is about to go into testing. So I, I, I won't outline it um, in this interview, but I'll do, I'm happy to share it in the future. Um, but I did find a way that I believe I can have a subscription program return a much higher lifetime value. And it's not a massive shift, but what it took was the second perspective. I never would have got there if I just followed best practices and what everybody else is doing. I got there because I asked a couple smarter questions, which is it's very easy to do. It takes very little time, right? The effort is seconds, right? 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute to ask yourself some different questions and think on a second perspective or another um, solution. And that's the unlock that it gives. And I've done the math on this new subscription program. And on paper, it's going to significantly outperform their traditional subscription program. But now it's got to go into testing, which is, you know, I'm happy to, to share it. I just wanted to let, let's, let's let it prove out and work um, and not just go theor theoretical on that. But um, what I really want people to understand is use the framework, frameworks against the leverage points of the business. That's where you'll see the progress. Like if you do that to multiple leverage points, it's how you double a company's revenue really fast. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. It's like one, look at it from a different perspective and two, focus it on those leverage points, right? Which could be where you can make more money or where you can get more efficient. Because even like, I, I was saying through even like, we could do a live example of like one day design. It's our, you know, build, design a web page in one day. We can do design development. We also do a lot of other design creative. And so like 
me as like the business owner, I'm like, okay, um, you know, how do I get this to a million dollars, 83K a month, right? And then from an operations perspective, like our director of ops is like, you know what would be really nice? A lot of re repeat customers. It's easier to manage, easier to fill. Sure. So instead of getting all these new customers, how can I just get 16 customers that'll pay me five grand a month, right? Yep. And then as I kind of go down this like copywriting perspective, it's like, how do I write like the most amazing copy that converts and come up with the most amazing offer around retention, right? Mm -hmm. And then even like, what well, what is, and the thing that we're trying to get to is like with these ideal personas, like if they landed on our webpage, what would they see where they're like, take my money? And yeah, you kind of like go through this thought process and that's kind of led to a couple things. One, testing things outside of just landing pages, but they care about recurring work around ad creative, emails, um, organic, things like that. But, and if we have such a good lifetime value where they're paying us 5K per month, yep. could we lose money on that first month and give them something for free? So, so it's an irresistible offer. So like putting on those different hats, it just makes you start to play this game where all of a sudden the ideas start flowing in to think outside the box because I'm very guilty as a marketer. My first thing is let me go look at a competitor and see what they're doing. Right. Which is, which is good and bad. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So you're, 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 you're applying it exactly correct. Look, you've, you've been through the whole masterclass. So, so that that's correct. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a simple unlock, right? When you can take a step-by-step -step process to um, look at things differently, you're going to get, it's, it's just not a lot of work. Um, but you're going to get to that non-obvious answer. And what I really start getting into teaching are things like, how do you take a non-linear leap and find something truly creative or truly innovative in these leverage points, right? I'm not saying go invent the new iPhone. I'm saying, can you innovate in each of the leverage points of your business, the pricing, the bundling, the copy, the subscription programs, and so on. Um, and if you can take, you know, add your flavor, your twist, to each one of those, um, you know, I am able to get a 20% pickup in one of these areas and a 15% pickup in another and a 30% efficiency pickup in, a, in yet a third. And if you can do that to five or six or seven leverage points, that's how you do it, right? That's how you double the revenue of a company really quickly. And so I really get into that leverage concept in that free training I referenced. So just drop that in the show notes so people can find it if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people that might be listening, if you're like a business owner or want to start something like I struggle with this too, with time management, it's like, where can you have the biggest impact on strategy and everything else? Because like, there's a spectrum of, you know, the tasks that you do, is it a $1 task, respond to email, or is it like a $10,000 million task that can transform the business? So it's like, if you want to focus on those big tasks, it's like, focus on the leverage points, and then think of it from different perspectives because you 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 want to be innovative and, and creative. However, one thing that I think you've helped do is that sounds like a lot of pressure. It's like, oh, be innovative. Like, okay, let me go like put on my innovation hat and do it. But one thing that you've kind of demystified is you don't have to be the smartest person to be creative and innovative. It's more just about looking at things from different perspectives and connecting dots. And yes. I think that's that's been helpful because it's super intimidating to be like, oh, be Steve Jobs. It's like, okay, that sounds very hard, you know? Right. Yeah, it's not an IQ test, right? It's it's creative thinking. And once it's into the framework, then it's really just a step-by-step, -step, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not, it, it's a very valid point, right? It feels like maybe it's daunting. It's actually not. And I kind of referenced this uh, a while back, but um, when I was first doing this, it was full of friction, full of high effort to deliver on this for mm -hmm. myself. And, and so I, what I was doing is I was using some of the techniques and I was having success with them, but they took so much time and effort that I would use them for a week or two. I'd get a big breakthrough or a big insight and help me scale up, you know, Facebook ads or whatever it was. And then I wouldn't use the technique again for four months or six months because it was it was just full of effort. And one of the most rewarding things for me in this program is, you know, I've got students going back uh, three plus years, maybe probably four years at this point. And, you know, when we all listen to podcasts or go to conferences and, and sit through sessions or read books, how much are you learning that you're still applying three weeks later? 
or three months later or a year later? And for most people, the answer is almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And with this, I have students, like I get emails, phone calls, text messages. I get video messages because people show me what they do um, uh, about three a week. And these are students going back as far as three and a half years ago when I first started uh, teaching this. Um, but I will get about three messages a week of people saying, hey, I use the framework and I just got a, this big insight or this big breakthrough. My revenue just grew. I mean, you even sent me one, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's very rewarding that what I've done is we've stripped out the friction and we've taken it from being anything that's a heavy lift or daunting. And we make it really simple, really easy to follow, actually fun. And for me, like the example that I just gave in that um, little mini training is, you know, asking yourself a question to change your perspective literally takes you five seconds. Mm -hmm. And then to think of an alternative solution might take you 30 seconds to a minute, but th that's what we're talking about. All in time commitment for this is 30 seconds to a minute, and it might be the unlock you need to get the growth that you want. And if you're not thinking that way or don't have, like, if you don't feel you've got the time to think that way, you shouldn't be the founder of a company. Like, yeah. Boy, I mean, unless you've launched something that's so spectacularly different and taking off to the moon and all you got to do is fulfill orders, um, I hope uh, people would be resonating with that kind of, um, you know, creative process. Yeah, and it's fine. I'm very guilty of let me like always have my earbuds in and have a new podcast or audiobook. I'm just trying to consume, yep. but it's like, what of that am I really processing and putting out there? And I've kind of like slowed down on that instead of consuming really just starting to think, right? And really put some of this into action. And it's, um, I don't know, I feel like I actually learn more by by doing that, which is kind of counterintuitive, but- um, For sure. No, yeah. Well, and look, we can, give, we can give an example live that we just played out on this podcast. So I asked, um, I was kind of thinking through how, um, it, when I do interviews like this, which I don't do a lot, but when I do interviews like this, I'm actually going on a, a web show with a friend of mine tomorrow. Um, you know, rather than just sort of the stand, like what's the standard format? What's the normal approach for someone being interviewed on a podcast? Right. And yeah. I, you've done a bunch. So why don't you tell like what, what yeah, is it's kind of the linear story of their career lessons learned around the way. It's a little sporadic. And if you listen all the way through, maybe you'll pick up some tidbits and hopefully there's some good banter, right? Yeah. Right, so there's, the, there's the typical format. And so it's that's the common point of view. So I was looking for what's the uncommon point of view or the non-obvious way that I could add value. And I, I hope I just did it, which is I presented a training, right? And I actually put time and effort into building out a training. Like, that, like that's not part of my masterclass. That's just training I'm willing to help people um, to think about things differently. And so I, I think that's like, that is a way I'm going to approach any interview that I do, which is let's add genuine value to people investing their time and give them a practical way to apply what I'm trying to teach. And so, you know, that it, it doesn't, it didn't take me more than about a minute to think through what might be valuable to people, uh, to come up with, okay, let me just do some hardcore training. Let's just get into it and let's see how it goes over. Like we'll, we'll know in the comments, like hopefully the training was useful. Maybe I went too deep. I don't know, but um, I hope people found it valuable. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I'm, as I'm like thinking through some of my favorite growth stories or marketing examples, I think one of the common themes is them being innovators and doing something different, almost zigging when people are zagging. Yep. Um, and I, I don't think that gets hit on enough, right? Cause it's, it's very, you know, kind of, subjective and, and, and whatnot, but no, man, I thought it was exciting. And one thing just to call out, like on like the, and by the way, I, I'm not getting any kickback or plug for this. Maybe I should. Um, <laughs> um, but um, what, what's exciting is you give a lot of tools to have in your tool belt to go through this and maybe like some work better for others. Um, but there's some really cool exercises. And I think what's exciting just to tease on the classes, you bring in a lot of science and you bring in a lot of examples of, Hey, this is what, Einstein did. This is what Walt Disney did. This is what, you know, yep. um, Steve Jobs did. And I think stuff like that is really fun to see where as you start to peel back the onion, it's like, wow, this has been happening in informal ways 
throughout history on how people work in their process. Yes. And I, I think I really enjoy nerding out on people's process for, for how they do things. Yes, for sure. Like once you can see the way, you know, once you see how someone else did it, it certainly makes it like you said, the word you use demystifies, right? Demystifies it yeah. for how we can apply it to our business. So uh, yeah. And also the same thing, uh, I'll offer one last thing. I and mean, if they go to the website, um, I'm happy. Uh, I do teach the first section of the masterclass for free. So you can get that on the homepage. So the forward slash Oxford page, you get the 30 minute training. Um, and then if you actually want the first hour of the class free, you can just go to the homepage. Um, everything I teach is live. So let's go counterintuitive again. So what's the, you might know it or you might, you can guess at it. What do you think the average completion rate is of an online course? Oh, it's gotta be super low, right? Yeah. It's like five to 7%, something like oh, that. Oh man. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just like, and there's great stats online. If, like how many people buy books versus how many people finish a book? It's the same, oh. <laughs> like 5%, same thing. Yeah. Same thing. yeah. Number. The completion rate of my course is somewhere around 98%. And the difference is I teach it live, right? When it's recorded, it's easy to skip. It's easy to fast forward, put it on quick speed. You get interrupted. You don't come back to it, right? I teach it live because I'm coaching people. And so I teach it in small groups and the groups are usually between one and five people, um, but everything is taught live and it can be customized to people and their business and their problems. Um, so it's, again, what I'm illustrating there is the, just, I want people thinking differently. It's the counterintuitive approach. I can't tell you the number of people who think I'm an idiot that I haven't recorded this <laughs> telling it because it scales and I get it right. But it's also not adding the value that I want it to add. So eventually I probably will record it, but as of now I'm sticking with live, I'm trying to impact people in their businesses. And at the moment I don't see, um, you know, changing that for live yet uh, at some point, maybe, but not yet. Yeah. Well, I told you, you should make it a book. I see how long your slides are. You could easily have a 150 page book, but, um, but maybe in due time. Yeah. Very good. Very <laughs> um, good. Well, well, one last question, if you have an extra second, and I always like to ask everybody is what's the nicest thing anyone's done for you in your professional career? Ah, uh, okay. So I have, really good friends in the digital world. I go to a lot of conferences. I do a lot of networking. I've run my own groups. I've been in other groups. So I, I've had a lot of people help me out over the years in lots of ways. Um, I, hope, I hope I've given them as much value back, but um, I've been fortunate to have really smart friends, uh, both in the corporate world, you know, vice presidents of digital and in the solopreneur world. So I, I've had lots of people offer me um, lots of help. Um, but one example kind of does stand out. So I had a, a friend of mine who I've known for years. I don't want to out him just because he's he's really a private person and I would kind of need his permission uh, to share it. But very good friend of mine, a really successful digital marketer, uh, has run a bunch of different companies, um, but he was launching a new um, business and he wanted help marketing um, the business. And so he called me up and he basically wanted me to work as an affiliate model. Right, he wanted me to drive new business for the company, generate sales, and take a rev share. But when in his estimations and his planning, he thought I would need to go out of pocket about thirty thousand dollars before I'd ever get paid, and I get paid thirty days later. So I'd be out thirty k for somewhere like sixty days, and air quotes. Hopefully, it all works, and I get paid back thirty plus. And I just wasn't fully sold on this. I, I just didn't know. Like I knew the person and really trusted the person, but I still didn't know for sure about this business. And 30K is not an insignificant amount of money, right? And so um, I was really delaying and kind of came to the conclusion I wasn't going to do it. And he called me up and he goes, give me your bank account wiring instructions. I'm wiring you 30 grand. I'm not going to let you miss this. <laughs> hired me $30,000. And with my first check, I paid him back, but it was one of the most successful things I've ever worked on. And I would have missed it. And just the fact that he knew me so well, I mean, he knew I could add value, but you know, there was a lot of trust there in, in him doing this, but like, that's over and beyond, man. Like that was really cool of him. And I'd love to give his name. Some people might know him. I don't know, but um, I, I really have to ask his permission because he does, he does avoid the limelight, <laughs> but yeah, that was well, that super cool. Uh, really cool of him 
And um, I do everything I can to, to pay it back. And I, I think I've added a lot of value. I mean, he's, he's actually been through a liquid mind as well. That's cool. What, what, yeah, that's an awesome story. It's, it's moves like that that allow you to like take those big leaps um, and de-risk it a little bit. That, that's a really good one. But um, well, Will, I know we already dropped kind of the URL in. Maybe we could do it one more time, but like where should people go if they want to learn more about you or Liquid Mine or what's going on? Is, is the best place the website? Yeah, for sure. So I'm not active um, on the social media platforms. It's another thing I kind of <laughs> go against. Um, but you'll find me for sure um, on the website. So Liquid Mind Li- uh, sorry, liquidmindmasterclass.com. And then uh, the homepage, you can get the first uh, hour of the masterclass. The masterclass is six hours, six weeks um, training. And then uh, you can get the first hour for free. It is taught live. It'll be a group of you know one to five people, depending on time zones. And then if you want the actual free training we referenced, which is like a 30, 35 minute training I gave at Oxford, you can get that at this, you know, Liquid Mind Masterclass forward slash Oxford. Um, and that's totally free as well. So um, yeah, and feel free to email me, just will at Liquid Mind Masterclass, happy to answer questions. I love networking and uh, meeting founders and you know helping uh, other CEOs. I've really enjoyed working with you and Jonathan, you really smart guys, and I love what you're up to. So um, yeah, uh, I love it. Other than that, you might find me on stage. I'm starting to speak a lot more. So um, I just spoke at Founders Mastermind uh, last week and I'm gonna speak at uh, Blue Ribbon coming up in uh, May. So yeah, I'll be out there. Yeah, head up well before he blows up is what I recommend. But well, thank you so much, man. This was a blast, a long time coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Great to see you.